I have spent the last year of my life researching how climate change is threatening the culture and very survival of a group of people in the southwestern regions of Uganda whom I have never met. I was drawn to the experiences of the Badwa pygmies because these forest dwellers, original inhabitants of the land, today number just 6,200 people. As a result of legacies of eviction from their traditional forests, the Badwa have been pushed to marginal lands that are highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. The displacement experienced by the Badwa has always been tied to environmental factors. In the 1930s, the British colonial government began declaring protected areas within Ugandan forests, pushing the Badwa further away from the resources and lands on which they had depended since time immemorial. Of the Badwa who remained, the fate of their violent eviction continued as sedentary farming communities and logging corporations encroached on their land. The rights of the Badwa to access and use their traditional lands and resources ignored, as the Ugandan government backed the imposition of private land rights that prohibited the group's freedom of movement in the forests and allowed for their degradation in ensuing decades. The last straw came in the early 1990s when the Ugandan government established a national park and forest reserve, ordering the eviction of all who entered and settled in the forests, including the Badwa. Since the erection of these so-called protected areas, the Badwa have been forced into a period of subsequent adjustment to life outside the forests, a transition which has proven relatively unsuccessful. Much of the social cohesion that has historically held the group together has been lost, as households have scattered across neighboring lands where today most squat informally. The Badwa have been forced to find new, in most cases, non-culturally appropriate means of survival. Their precarity, coupled with high levels of social marginalization and no government assistance, have pushed them to take up the livelihood strategies of the communities on whose lands they reside, pushing them into a dependency on rain-fed agriculture, a livelihood highly sensitive to the impacts of climate change. For example, rising temperatures and aridity levels have contributed to slope, soil, and land erosion, crop pests, and locust attacks, which combined with population pressure, have contributed to over-cultivation, reduced agricultural productivity, and crop failure that further threaten the food security, income generation, and survival of the Badwa. At stake today is the very existence of the Badwa peoples, their cultural survival, collective continuance and futurity, including the transmission of their culture to future generations, their indigenous knowledges for mitigating and adapting to the environmental change that now threatens to displace them further or to wipe them off the face of the earth entirely as a peoples. While my ability to access the Badwa as a researcher and advocate based in London has been limited, I was drawn to highlight the experiences of the Badwa in my work for three reasons. Firstly, because the threats faced by the Badwa reflect merely one example in a growing trend of experience for those who live in close relationships and dependencies intertwined with their environments. Today, millions inhabit climate-fragile corners of the Earth that are increasingly becoming uninhabitable, ripping away the resources, social, cultural, and economic fabrics on which people depend. Secondly, because I know that the threats faced by the Badwa, like so many others, are only set to worsen on a warming planet. And thirdly, because I recognize the real risk of the extinction of the Badwa, like so many others, as the Ugandan authorities and the world turn their glance away from the threats they face, reducing the Badwa and millions more to the realm of climate abandonment. Millions are, and will only continue to be, forced to move to cope with the impacts of climate breakdown.
Indeed, an average of 25 million people have been forced to move each year, related to climatic impacts such as sea level rise, drought and desertification, extreme weather events such as floods and storms, and environmental degradation. That equates to 67,000 displacements per day, or 41 people whose lives are uprooted every minute. And estimates suggest that anywhere between 216 million and up to 1 billion people could be displaced by mid-century. The latter would reflect one-tenth of the global population displaced by 2050. Despite alarmist media depictions of a crisis of refugees flooding into the western frontiers of Europe and North America that instigate a sense of panic and a reaction to close and securitize borders, most who move and who will move in the future do so within their countries, never crossing an international border. For example, a 2010 study of displacement following riverbank erosion in rural Bangladesh found that the average distance moved across 600 households to cope with the erosion was just one kilometer, with the furthest distance reflecting a mere 10 kilometers. This example illuminates both the lack of financial resources of individuals and families to move further distances, and perhaps their reluctance to relocate, whether temporarily or permanently. Another recent survey in climate change hotspot, the mountainous Andes of Peru, assessed the wishes of more than 400 households to consider moving or to remain in place to cope with perceived changes in temperature extremes, precipitation, glacier melt, and increasingly unpredictable changes in seasonal weather patterns. Those considering moving cited their lack of income and employment opportunities bad harvests, and their desires to build better lives for themselves as motivations. Those wishing to remain in place cited insufficient resources to move, obligations toward their families, properties, and assets, social ties to home, and their fear of a lack of opportunities as motivations for remaining. For those who wish to remain in place, a common and understandable wish, many risk becoming trapped, Trapped by intersecting and underlying social, economic, cultural, and political vulnerabilities as they are amplified and exacerbated by the impacts of climate change. This risk of entrapment stems from failures to recognize the impacts of climate change as contributing to mixed drivers of migration. It also stems from pervasive gaps within the legal rights-based framework for the protection of those who move in order to cope effectively creating a legal vacuum for many who move in order to cope with the impacts that climate breakdown amplifies. Hence, while I've never met the millions of people in grave need of protection, assistance, and visibility, I find myself tirelessly devoted to them, to their lives, their opportunities, their rights, and their survival. Why? I stand here today to share my reasons with you. I share them in the hopes that they will inspire a shift in paradigm around how we think about and prepare for what the world's leading scientific body on climate change warned in 1990 would be the largest secondary impact of climate change on human populations, migration. I share them with a sense of urgency in order to advocate that we must carve out spaces for the protection of the sources of food and water, life-giving jobs and enriching educational spaces, the priceless sense of community, home, hope, and belonging, the rights and the survival of children, young and old, mothers and fathers, farmers, educators and mentors, persons with disabilities, the elderly, and the future generations who risk losing everything when and if displaced. I share two primary motivations for my decision to devote my life to advancing the protection of those on the front lines of climate-related displacement in order to assert their humanity within how we conceive of their human rights 
and alternatively to provoke reflection around how we deny their humanity when we deny their rights, visibility to the threats they face, and their related prospects for survival. Firstly, wrapped up within complex decisions to move or stay are the wishes and needs of individuals, families, and communities to ensure their basic needs are met. These include needs such as food, water, safe housing, health care and medicine, access to education and employment, and the need to live in a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Foundational pillars of life that are threatened as the impacts of climate change make it increasingly difficult to cultivate food, as sources of water become scarce, as extreme weather events devastate the habitability of homes, local infrastructure, and roads, and making it to work and to school becomes increasingly difficult. Each one of these needs that are threatened reflect human rights, to which all persons are deserving of protection. Wherever there is a right, there is a duty on state governments to take steps to ensure that right. By this, we must understand, firstly, that the threats of climate change and related displacement reflect human rights issues. And secondly, that it is the responsibility of state governments around the world to take steps to ensure such rights are respected. In cases where individuals are left with no choice but to move in order to cope, they hold the right to migrate and to seek asylum in the case that they cross an international border. It is the responsibility of states to apply international laws to determine who counts as an internally displaced person or refugee and to ensure their rights are respected in the case of and during such displacement. Thus, I am compelled to dedicate my energy towards advancing the protection of those on the front lines of climate-related displacement because their protection is an issue of rights. If we truly want to live in a world where everyone has the assurances of their basic needs and where the inalienable rights of all are respected, then I advocate we must begin to think empathetically about those who are displaced or at risk of displacement through the lenses of dignity, equality, justice, fairness, and humility, the fundamental principles that underpin their rights, mine and yours. Secondly, I am devoted to the protection of millions of vulnerable peoples who I have never met because their protection is a matter of justice. Climate change hits poor countries and communities harder than it does rich ones. Resources to cope, to bounce back from catastrophic events and to prepare for impending ones are finite. Most are already under-resourced, underdeveloped, and lack the capacities through which to ensure the basic needs of all are met. Despite that they have played only a minuscule role in producing the emissions that have led to the warming of our planet, such countries and communities bear a disproportionate burden of high climate vulnerability. The richest 20% consume 80% of the world's natural resources and produce 90% of waste. The United Kingdom emits as much carbon dioxide as Nigeria, Pakistan, Morocco, and Peru combined. California emits as much as the world's 50 poorest countries, and Texas and New Jersey alone emit as much carbon dioxide as all of sub-Saharan Africa. Despite this, it is these countries in the West who build fortress walls around their borders and spew harmful rhetoric and false depictions about hordes of migrants arriving at them. Yet it is the rights, the livelihoods, and the lives of those uprooted that are in crisis and in need of protection. Not the Western world and its inhabitants who so eagerly strive to turn their backs on flows of migrants who have little chance of ever arriving at their borders. People are only going to continue to have to move. As the impacts of climate change and the loss and damage they purport do not stop short of international borders, we must reconceive the ways we conceive of borders, the opportunities they create and limit, the protection they have the power to restrict or afford, 
and the sense of belonging or exclusion they have the power to inscribe. We need to be realistic about movement on a warming planet and to open up safe, humane, and orderly pathways for people to move in dignity. We need to assist communities in diversifying their livelihoods, equipping them with the employable skills and education through which they can contribute to the societies they relocate to. We need to reconceive of migration as a form of adapting to the impacts of climate change, as a natural human response for a human-caused crisis, not as a threat, but as an opportunity for the individuals who move and the societies that receive them. Yet we must also carve out space for the protection of those who wish to remain in place, ensuring the rights of all are respected, no matter their strategy to cope. As a matter of justice, Western industrialized nations who are largely responsible for the climate crisis must commit themselves to reducing their emissions to providing the finance and resources necessary for poor countries and communities to cope, and to carving out space in their laws and policies for the protection of those who move and those who stay, as their livelihoods, lives, and futurity are threatened. We in the West, and in positions of power and privilege the world over, must close our mouths and open our ears to the needs of those on the front lines of the climate crisis and on the edge of climate-related displacement, carving out space for them to speak the truth of their experiences to power, supporting and equipping them to champion their own solutions. Beyond legal bureaucracy, judges, lawyers, and states as the gatekeepers of justice and of rights, I stand here to dare us to imagine a world where Earth can be a sacred place of refuge for all. Thank you.